There's a lighthouse on a hillside that overlooks life's sea. And when I'm tossed about, it sends out a light that I might see. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome back to the site. Uh, my name is Mike McDonald, and we are uh, continuing in Galatians chapter 3 as in our Bible study. Before we get started in that, though, since we are uh, talking about studying the Word of God, we need to go to God in prayer uh, and uh, so that He will be uh, able to help us understand His Word. Uh, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, then it's your responsibility right now to silently uh, confess all known sin to God the Father. If you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that is irrelevant to you. The only thing important to you right now is believe that Jesus is the Savior. So let's go to the Father right now in, in prayer and confess silently all known sin. <clears throat> Gracious Father, thank you for today and thank you for your word. We ask that you help us understand your word and apply it to our lives. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we're in Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Last time I think we got uh, through with verse 6, and we're starting on verse 7. I uh, remember Paul is in Antioch, and he's writing this uh, epistle to the churches in Galatia that he and Barnabas started. Uh, well, that was about six months ago, we, uh, we estimate. Uh, <clears throat> and in that time, he's had, uh, or the churches in Galatia have had uh, Judaizers move in uh, and disparage Paul and the message that he sent them, that he gave them, uh, in that they told uh, the people, the believers in those churches, that Paul was not really a true apostle uh, and that he did not give them all of the information they needed. In fact, they needed to believe that Jesus was the Christ, and they also needed to uh, follow the Mosaic Law. In particular, they needed to follow uh, the rite of circumcision, uh, or God would not be satisfied with them. So Paul is writing them back, and he has completely uh, defended his apostleship and he has completely defended his message in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now in chapter 3 and 4, he's going to go over the true message. And we are in verse 7. I will read uh, verse 6, uh, but we covered that last, last week, so uh, the, just as an introduction to verse 7. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness... Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So he's getting real serious now. Uh, in the NASB, therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. So Paul is still attacking the lies of the Judaizers. He has shown them that Abraham was declared righteous by God before the rite of circumcision was instituted uh, to signal or as a sign of the covenant that he made with Abraham. Also, uh, hundreds of years uh, later, uh, Moses was given the law. Uh, it was... So Abraham was declared righteous hundreds of years before the law was ever in existence. Uh, so Abraham was declared righteous uh, 
long before that. Now, uh, he addresses something that's really going to get serious with the Judaizers. He addresses ancestry. Uh, he wants the Galatians, the believers in Galatia, to know what God says constitutes a son of Abraham. And he says, therefore, be sure. Uh, that's one word, <laughs> know ye, uh, and it's uh, genoskete. And uh, this particular uh, word uh, can, can be translated as a present active imperative, or it can be translated as a uh, present active uh, indicative. It can either be translated as just something that's true and real, uh, or as a command or an entreaty. So uh, as we know that um, command or in the imperative mood indicates a command or an entreaty. Um, and so it's uh, trying to get action from a certain person. So Paul is here trying to get them to realize something. So it's probably good to translate this as an imperative. <clears throat> Uh, and that is because the believers, apparently in Galatia, are acting as if they no longer believe the truth of this verse. Uh, they no longer believe what Paul told them to begin with. Uh, and we can compare uh, Galatians chapter 1, uh, verse 6 and 7, uh, to come up with that assumption. In verse uh, 6 of chapter 1 in Galatians, he says, I marvel that you are... Uh, that you are turned away so soon from Him, that would be Jesus, who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So he's amazed that they have turned away so soon. Uh, and they no longer are apparently believing what Paul told them to begin with. So Paul is entreating them to know this. Uh, the root word of, of this uh, verb, gnosko, uh, is... The, the basic meaning of that is to take in knowledge. Uh, in the aorist tense is what we have here. Uh, it means to ascertain or to realize something. So he's saying realize this, that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham in ASB. So this not only includes the Gentiles Paul is addressing, this includes every other human being on earth who has ever believed that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, and it does something else. Besides it including everybody that has believed that Jesus is the Christ, it eliminates some people. <laughs> and it eliminates some people who are very close to these Judaizers. It eliminates them. Uh, those who do not believe or have faith that Jesus is the Christ, are not considered by God sons of Abraham. Uh, Genesis uh, chapter 17, verse 6, you can compare, we're talking about biology. This verse is obviously not referring to biology. This verse is referring to faith. Um, people of, the, of Jewish descent who do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed Savior, are not considered sons of Abraham by Scripture. The word son here is weoi. It's a masculine plural noun. Uh, there are numerous uh, words to reference children uh, in Greek, just like there are in, in uh, English. This particular word, weos, uh, is the singular uh, indicates an adult son uh, ready for inheritance or uh, qualified for inheritance. And that is a significant distinction because uh, when this was written and before uh, in this culture, uh, fathers did not necessarily claim the children that they sired. Uh, and as a result of that, it was a custom that uh, at some point after the child's birth, usually in his adult, uh, either his teenage years or his young adult years, 
would be the time that the father would either declare the son, the son uh, a uh, one of his children and and qualified for inheritance from him, or he would disqualify him from it. So uh, uh, this word was used to signify uh, male children sired by a father who was claiming them as an heir. Uh, so. Uh, God is saying here in, in Scripture <clears throat> that for you to be a heir of Abraham, uh, you have to do it by faith. So uh, this indicates an adult son in the line of inheritance. So we see that Scripture declares that Abraham has a spiritual seed and he also declares that he has a natural seed. Well, in the Old Testament, uh, the spiritual seed, this is not something new. Uh, this is just something overlooked uh, by the Jews in the Old Testament. Old Testament declares that from the very beginning, and it does it with a particular phrase. Uh, and you know the phrase. Uh, it just probably has not been uh, emphasized to you enough. Uh, in the Old Testament, the phrase that talks about that is, I am the God of Abraham. Isaac, and Jacob. That is a very frequent identification uh, by God of Himself. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, think about that. Uh, Isaac was not the only male child of Abraham, and Jacob was not the only male child of uh, Isaac. But, they were the children that believed in Jesus, the, believed God that He was going to send uh, a sacrifice, and they were the chosen heirs by God to indicate that. Three generations was enough to make that doctrinal principle, and so he's always, he always identifies himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He still does that, indicating another thing, indicating that he's not the God of dead people. He's the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. They are with God now. They're not in resurrection body yet. They will be uh, after, uh, after the tribulation, but they're not in resurrection body now. But they are with God, and, he, and they are alive. So uh, Isaac... Okay, I did that. Isaac is, is the chosen son. Uh, he's the son that believed. He's not a perfect son. He, he and his mother, uh, uh, well, uh, Jacob and his mother uh, tricked Isaac into giving him the inheritance. But that's beside the point. Uh, that was God's design that he would have the inheritance. It's also God's design that, <coughs> it, that uh, the faith would descend through him. So, now Paul explains all of that in the New Testament. And we continue, verse 8, <clears throat> NASB. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, quote, All the nations shall be blessed in you. This is an absolutely remarkable verse uh, that many people just read and completely uh, overlook so many things. Okay, to begin with, and the Scriptures. Okay, we're talking about Old Testament Scriptures. I'm not going to uh, read all of them, but I'm going to refer to uh, one of them for sure. But these Old Testament Scriptures, you can write them down. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, chapter 18, verse 18, chapter 22, verse 18, chapter 26, verse 4, and chapter 28, verse 14. Uh, did you get all those? Okay. Paul sees in these promises more than mere temporal material blessings mediated by Abraham's descendants, the nation of Israel. He sees more than that. 
he sees a primary reference to this fact, okay? Foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Okay, foreseeing is uh, proidusa, uh, and it is uh, an aorist active participle. Uh, a particular thing that I want you to not overlook. Who is Scripture saying is doing the foreseeing? Okay, what, who's, who's doing the foreseeing here? Scripture is doing the foreseeing. And later on, we're going to see that Scripture is doing the preaching. Paul is here using the verb foreseeing uh, I'm, I'm sorry, is using the, the noun Scripture and the noun God as synonymous terms. Scripture and God. So Scripture is foreseeing and Scripture is doing the preaching. So uh, Paul is using these words uh, synonymously. And remember in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, we're told that uh, the Word of God is alive and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Scripture is doing the foreseeing here, and Paul is declaring that to us. Okay, justify, all right? Dikai oi. That is, declare righteous. When you're justified by God, you are declared righteous. And he does that in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And now we get to verse 3, where is what Paul is referring to. And I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is before Scripture tells us that Abraham is declared righteous. Okay, But this is when Abraham, we know that Abraham gets declared righteous right then. He is hearing God, he is believing God, and his actions prove that he believes God. He, he does what God tells him to do. Uh, and then we continue on uh, with all those other things that uh, the, scripture, the Scriptures that Paul's referring to. Uh, so Scripture is foreseeing that God would end up justifying Gentiles by faith. Uh, he's foreseeing that. That's uh, something that... Uh, uh, Let's see, this is an aorist active participle. Uh, so we have this uh, taking place before the main verb uh, of justifying. Uh, and further in this verse, uh, we have a scripture preaching. Paul is using scripture synonymously with God. Justify, declare righteous, by faith. Ek pisteos. Uh, so not by faith and works, not by faith and following ordinances, not by faith and following sacramental uh, uh, observances, by faith, period. So the Gentiles, NASB, uh, ta ethnane, uh, the, this is nations, this is all the nations. This is every nation uh, other than Israel uh, is what this covers. And frequently it's, uh, it's translated Gentiles because the Jews thought everybody that wasn't a Jew was a Gentile. Uh, so the nations, everyone other than Hebrews, preached the gospel beforehand. Uh, and, that's, and that is exactly what that... That's just one word. Preach good tidings beforehand. Again, notice that Paul is saying that Scripture is doing the preaching. Well, when did that happen? When did Scripture do the preaching to Abraham? As I have said, the term gospel means good news or good tidings. In the NASB, it sometimes refers to justification. That means being declared righteous 
by faith. Other times, it refers to sanctification, uh, which is uh, uh, growing in grace, growing in the knowledge of God, or perseverance in the faith while you are here on earth, uh, doing good works while you are here on earth. And Scripture refers to God uh, declaring that work uh, a justified work or just giving you uh, decl- uh, crediting you with righteousness when you do a good work if you are a believer and if you have done that good work while you're in fellowship. So uh, Galatians uh, chapter 2 verses 19 and 20 uh, good works uh, are good works before God only if done by a believer in fellowship. So Abraham believed God when he was in Haran and the Lord told him to leave. said, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Genesis 12, 1. And Abraham did that. Abraham was justified at that point. This is our first record of Abram, actually, uh, learning from God believing the message, and manifesting that belief by obedience. Paul is referring to this passage, Genesis 12, verses 1 and 3, and what does he say, uh, what does he quote as the gospel in this passage? All the nations shall be blessed in you. That's the good news. That's the good news of God I have a Savior and I am sending Him through your line and all of the nations will be blessed in you. The gospel is God's good news concerning His Son. Abraham believed that good news and was born spiritually at that time when he did that. That only happens once and it's permanent. Uh, The rest of the time we're referring to Abraham being justified. He, He is... Earning good, earning justification, earning rewards actually uh, by doing good works. Again, Paul here referring to Scripture, speaking as though God was speaking, rightly affirms that what the Bible says, God says. This and similar verses, and those similar verses, I won't re- I won't uh, read those verses, but I'll give them to you. Uh, and, and mark them down. John chapter 10, verse 35b, the second half of verse 35. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. There are more, but th- those are enough. They provide important support for believing in the absolute and total inspiration and authority of Scripture. And Paul is uh, doubling down on that right now. Okay, verse 9. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. So Paul concludes the phrase, this phase of his argument, by stating that though provision was made for all nations, in verse 8, only those who have faith receive the blessing of justification even though God has made provision for all people to be justified, He has made that provision, verse 8, only those who have faith receive the blessing of justification. The words, Abraham the believer, in ASB, are believing Abraham, is the way the New King James has it, emphasize justification by faith, not by works. Works aren't mentioned. We are declared righteous, eternally, 
eternal salvation by faith. Titus 3, 5. Uh, actually, Titus 3, 4 through 7, but uh, 5 is, is uh, emphasized. We are blessed, uh, eulogunti, uh, that's a present passive indicative. That means that you're blessed, ongoing blessed, Right now, blessed and ongoing. Uh, passive, it's done to you. Indicative mood, this is reality. Uh, you are spoken well of by God because of faith. Sanctification. So, the theme of blessing and cursing occurs throughout the epistle. Uh, it'll, it will continue to occur. Blessing and cursing continue. So here Paul uh, links God's blessing with faith in Christ. God's curses are reserved for those who seek to be justified by works of the law. Okay? God's curses uh, are not addressed to believers. Believers, justified sinners, we're all sinners, but we have been justified, uh, and we are justified because when we believed, God the Father imputed to us His righteousness. So we're credited with that and we are declared righteous at that point. Believers who seek to be sanctified, who seek to know more about God, who seek to um, uh, become closer to God by works of the law, fail. That doesn't work. And are in danger of being disciplined, sometimes disciplined severely. And Paul is addressing both of those facts because both of those facts are being attacked by the Judaizers. There's, some of them are saying you're not even saved. Others are saying, okay, you are saved, but you cannot maintain a relationship with God unless you keep the law. So Paul is addressing both of those things, uh, justification and sanctification. Verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, and then he quotes, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Okay. So, Having established the fact that justification is by faith from the experience of the Galatians and of Abraham, Paul then showed the illogic of reliance on the law. The word curse occurs twice in this verse and three times in verse 13. Uh, this is a curse that the law brings. The Greek word is kataron. Uh, in, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul declared a curse on anyone, any human or angel, that preached a different gospel than what he had preached. He used a different word. Uh, the word curse there is anathema. Okay, that is, according to my analytical lexicon of New Testament Greek by Robinson and House, that particular word for curse uh, indicates a devoting, of the, a devoting to that person a vengeance of goddesses. So that seems to me like uh, we're talking about demons, uh, vengeance of the goddesses. Uh, that sounds like we're talking about demons to me. However, Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words does not make that particular distinction. So I, we don't know for sure what, what that is. Uh, but what we do know, uh, what we do know for sure uh, is that in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul is the one commanding or entreating a curse on somebody. And here, he's telling us 
that it is the Mosaic law that is declaring a curse on somebody. And even though if you want to have the two words as synonymous terms, uh, it's not good. Okay, so as many as in ASB, that's hosoi. Uh, this word is used elsewhere in, in uh, Galatians to refer inclusive to everybody, all people, everybody in the world. Uh, chapter 6, verse 12, and verse 16, the same word. It's talking about everybody. So, contrary to what the Judaizers taught, the law could not justify, it could only condemn. That's the only thing the law can do, is condemn. Uh, Paul quoted Deuteronomy 27, verse 6, to show that the law demanded perfection and that a curse was attached to failure to keep any part of the law. It is written, de graptai, uh, perfect passive indicative. It has been written, is a more uh, accurate uh, uh, translation. Completed in the past with the results that continue. Now, when Deuteronomy was written, no one had a choice, okay? Uh, the only way to approach God was to follow the law. That's, that's the only way he accepted. So whether you knew the law or never heard of the law, the curse applied. You could not approach God. Okay? It applied to you no matter what. When Galatians was written, that was no longer the case. Christ had fulfilled the law. All right? That is why Paul makes a distinction. For as many as are of the works of the law. Uh, and even though the law had been fulfilled, there were still people and there still are people who think that the only way they can be justified before God is to follow the Mosaic law. And the only way they can be accepted by God after salvation is to follow the works of the law. Uh, if you choose to justify yourself by your works, number one, you fail because you can't do it. Nobody can do that. And you are under a curse uh, according to the law that you're trying to follow. If you choose to sanctify yourself by the law, you fail again. You can't get any closer to God by doing good works and thinking that's what's making you uh, closer to God. We often think that this is very unfair. Any, we hear preachers talk about failure of any part of the law and you've broken the whole law. Okay. Well, that's very similar to what we live under right now. Uh, we just don't think about it. Uh, what we live on right now, if you keep all of the laws of your culture, of your city, of your county, of your state, and of your country, uh, for 50 years, uh, you don't receive any reward for that. Uh, you just are not a lawbreaker. But if after 50 years you break one of those laws, you are considered a lawbreaker, period. Well, that's what, that's what the Mosaic Law did. If you break any one of the laws, you are considered a lawbreaker. And you fail. And you are condemned. Uh, so the only thing the law could do was condemn. That's the only thing it could ever do. And we'll stop there and pick up uh, the next time on the next one. Gracious Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. We ask that you help us understand your word and apply it to our lives. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. He has shown the light.